From the first video of this series, people have been waiting to train this lunar lander problem. Finally, we have all the components in place to train this task except one component, the reward function. We need to design a good reward function for this task, otherwise the agent might or might not ever learn to land the vehicle on the surface. Welcome to the sixth and last video of this reinforcement learning series and in this video we will learn how to design good reward functions that makes the training process very easy. Welcome to Campus 6, sit back, relax and learn. Up till now we have not been focusing on the most important component of reinforcement learning, the reward function. We studied in detail about what the policy and value functions are made up of, what learning algorithms should we use. Now it's time to focus on the most important component because of which our agent might or might not learn to solve a task no matter how good a learning algorithm you use. It is very important to design a good reward function for your agent to learn the optimal behavior. The question is what do I mean by a good reward function? A good reward function is anything that helps the agent learn to solve a particular task optimally. Let me give you a small example. Let's say you have this grid wall problem. The agent starts anywhere in the grid randomly and has to reach a goal. How would you design a reward function to help the agent reach the goal? The simplest reward function that you can design is this. You give zero rewards for every step taken, but you give positive one reward when the agent reaches the goal state. Seems like a good reward function. If you think carefully what this function is doing, you will see that it's not really helping the agent in any way to learn during the episode. For every step that the agent takes, it gets zero rewards which does not tell the agent whether the state is good or bad or even that state is near to the goal or not. How the agent has to learn the optimal policy is to randomly search the whole grid for the goal state. This random exploration might not even find the goal state infinitely and that's because the agent is getting no feedback in every step that it takes. Now I'm not saying that the agent will never learn. The agent will ultimately learn the optimal behavior given enough number of episodes and enough exploration. But the learning process will be very very slow and it will become exponentially slower if the grid size increases. Let's try another reward function. This time we will give plus 1 rewards for every step taken and plus 10 rewards at the goal state. Simple enough. You might think that this reward function is better because it at least gives some information to the agent about the environment. It gives positive rewards for every step taken so it encourages the agent to explore. But unfortunately that is not the case. If you think carefully, if the agent takes a path through the grid, it will get a series of positive one rewards. After some time, if the agent revisits the same particular state, this time it will take the same action as the last time because it has already received a positive reward for that action the last time. The values for that action will be higher. So the agent will continue to take the same path over and over again if we do not have any manual exploration strategy in place. This reward function does not even tell the agent that it should reach the goal in the least possible number of steps or reach the goal as early as possible. Now the question is what should be the reward function for this task? One classic reward function that we can use is to give minus one rewards for every step taken and either zero or plus one for reaching the goal state. Anything that is greater than minus one should be given at the goal state. Understand how this new reward function at least gives some information to the agent about the environment. When the agent takes a path through the grid world, it gets a series of minus one rewards. When the agent revisits the same states, it knows that it has already taken a particular action previously and that it has given it minus one reward the last day. Therefore, it will choose to take a different action this time. So this reward function automatically encourages exploration. What this reward function asks the agent to learn is a policy to get to the goal state in the least number of steps possible or should I say it should learn to reach the goal as soon as possible. It's like putting the agent under constant pain until it reaches the goal. That's why in our mountain card example, we give the agent minus one rewards for every step taken and zero if we reach the top of the mountain. Even this reward function has problems. 
it does not really tell the agent whether it is near to the goal state or not. These reward functions are called sparse rewards. Sparse rewards are those which rarely give useful rewards to the agent and gives rise to slow learning. Here is a graph that shows the reward distribution with respect to the distance from goal. If the distance is greater than 0.1, we give it 0 rewards. If the distance is less than 0.1, we give plus 1 rewards. So after the agent has crossed the distance of 0.1 and moves towards higher distances, the agent has no way of inferring that it is drifting away from the goal because it gets no feedback from the reward signal. Another kind of reward signal that we can use is shaped rewards. In shaped rewards, the rewards increase smoothly as the agent approaches the goal. In every step, the agent gets feedback whether it's moving towards the goal or not. You see how this is helpful, right? When the agent is near the goal, it knows that the goal is around somewhere. If the agent is drifting away from the goal, it will immediately understand that and correct its trajectory towards the goal. This reward function is a little easier and faster to learn but is complex to write. So let's design a shaped reward for a good old cart pole example. Our goal is to keep the pole upright by taking left or right actions on the cart. Ideally what we want is a reward function which not only helps the agent to learn to balance the pole from an unbalanced state but to keep the pole balanced even if the pole is drifting away from its balanced state. We want to give the agent some negative rewards if the pole is falling on some side. But if the agent is able to recover the pole from a somewhat unbalanced state to the balanced state, we want to give it positive rewards. One thing that tells the agent that the pole is moving away from its balanced state is the pole angle. If the pole is falling to the right, the pole angle will increase. Then we want to give it some negative rewards to indicate that it is a bad state. Therefore, we have to keep track of these two states. We want to give the reward at the current state based on the previous state. Let's keep a variable shaping which keeps track of the pole angle at every step. We calculate the shaping for these two states. Then reward can be the shaping at the current state minus the shaping at the previous state. Let's say the pole has drifted 4 degrees from its balance state. The previous shaping will hold 0 and the current shaping will hold 4. If we calculate the reward by subtracting the previous shaping from the current one, we get 4, which is positive. But we want to give negative rewards, right? So shaping can store the negative of the pole angle. Now the reward is calculated to be minus 4. Therefore, we give minus 4 rewards because the pole has drifted away from its balance state. Similarly, we can give the agent positive rewards if the pole is brought to its balance state. Let's say the previous position of the pole was at an angle minus 4 degrees. Minus 4 because the pole is angled to the left instead of right. If we calculate the rewards by subtracting the previous shaping from the current one, we get minus 4 rewards. Ideally, this should have been plus 4, right? This happens because our pole angle is positive or negative based on the side. We should therefore keep track of the square of the pole angle. You can also choose to store the absolute value too. If you store the negative of the square of the pole angle in shaping, the reward now becomes plus 16. Therefore, we give positive rewards for bringing the pole to its balanced state. Not only can we keep track of the pole angle, we can also ask the agent to keep the pole near the center of the screen by keeping track of the cart position in a similar way. We therefore add the square of the cart position in our shaping variable. We are actually saying that if the agent drifts away to the end of the screen, it's actually a bad state compared to keeping the pole in the center of the screen. Similar kinds of reasoning can be made to keep track of the cart velocity and pole angular velocity too. This is what our shaping variable holds now. Since these individual components have values less than 0, squaring these components results in numbers very less than 0. So we take the square root of this quantity keeping the minus outside. Basically, we are taking the root mean square of these quantities. Nothing complex. What it basically says that if the pole drifts away from the balanced position, the agent will get negative rewards. But if the agent brings the pole to its balanced state, it will get positive rewards. I trained an agent with this reward function and it was able to learn to balance the pole with fewer episodes than we had previously trained with. If I compare the lengths of the episodes for both of our training runs, we see that our new reward function 
the agent learned to keep the pool balanced within 70 episodes than that of the previous run with our old reward function which took about 200 episodes to balance the pool so shaped rewards do help the agent to learn if designed correctly we can do something similar in our mountain car problem too remember what our old reward function in this task was it was minus 1 for every step taken and zero after reaching the goal so let's design a shaped reward here too our main goal in this example is to let the agent know if it is near the goal or not therefore we keep track of the position of the car the first thing we do is rescale our position we increase the position by 0.5 This helps us design our function more effectively. If the agent reaches the goal, we give it plus hundred reward. That's the easy part. Now the hard part. We want to give the agent small positive rewards if it is moving towards the goal, and small negative rewards if it is going in the other direction. So our shaping variable can keep track of the position. To rescale our positions, we add zero point five to it. Our reward is the current shaping minus the previous shaping. See what this does. Let's say the agent moved from this point to this point towards the goal. If you calculate the reward, it turns out to be positive. If the agent moves from this point to this point, the rewards turn out to be negative. Great. Not only do we want the agent to know that it is moving towards or away from the goal, we also want it to increase its velocity to ultimately reach the top of the mountain. What we want to do is that for a particular position we should give it more rewards if it has more velocity. This encourages the agent to increase its velocity towards the goal. It turns out to be very easy to add this patch. We multiply the absolute value of the velocity in our reward function. Why absolute? Because the velocity changes from positive to negative when the car changes direction. Understand what this reward function is effectively doing. If the agent is moving towards the goal with more and more velocity the agent gets more and more positive rewards but if the agent is moving away from the goal with more and more velocity it gets more and more negative rewards the agent still has to oscillate to increase its velocity and therefore it gets small positive and negative rewards but since our goal has a very high positive reward the return should actually be the highest for the policy that oscillates more and more thereby increasing the velocity to reach the goal I multiplied the rewards by 10000 as I found the individual values to be very low and then trained an agent with this reward function and compared it to our previous reward function. We compared the episode lengths. It might be a little hard to see that our old reward function took 1500 episodes to train, but our new one took 1200 episodes only. But you will notice a problem in the agent's behavior when you take a look at it. The problem is this See that the agent tries to oscillate as much as possible and tries to reach the goal at the last step. The agent does not try to optimize the oscillations and reach the top of the mountain as early as possible. Rather, it tries to oscillate as much as possible and tries to reach the goal as late as possible. This is happening because of our reward function. Our reward function might look like a good one that helps the agent know if it is behaving correctly or not, but inherently there is a fault in it. The reason why it is behaving like this is because we give it positive rewards to oscillate and increase its velocity. Recall why we did this. We did this to encourage the agent to increase its velocity, but that plan backfired because now what it's doing is oscillating more and more to collect more positive rewards and then it goes for the biggest reward at the goal. The agent is doing nothing wrong. It is doing exactly what the reward function is telling it to do. This oscillatory path gives it the maximum rewards. We did not design our reward function in a way to optimize the number of steps towards the goal and that's why this behavior. This is what I wanted you to know that even for a reward function that is very carefully designed can lead to very unexpected behaviors. If your agent is misbehaving just take some time to think if it's the reward function's fault. Now how do we design a reward function that lets the agent optimize its pathway, lets the agent know if it's moving towards the goal and encourages the agent to increase its velocity towards the goal? I know there are a lot of things to consider while designing this function but trust me the end results are amazing. Let's solve this step by step. First things first, we give plus 100 rewards if the agent has passed the goal. We don't want to give it any positive rewards while it is in the valley of the mountain. We give it positive rewards only when it reaches the goal. For all steps we give it negative rewards. We recall what we did in our grid world example. 
we make the agent optimize its pathway by giving it minus one rewards for every step. Here we give negative rewards for every step to optimize its pathway towards the goal. We also want to give the agent lesser negative rewards if it is near the goal and more negative rewards if it is away from the goal. To hit two birds with the same arrow, we do this. First, we rescale our position by subtracting 0.5 from it. Effectively, it makes all the positions negative and we can use it in our reward function. Our reward will be only our position, rescaled position. If you see what this does, at this point, the reward is less negative since it is near the goal. And at this point, the reward is more negative since it is away from the goal. We never give it any positive rewards. We only give it negative rewards while the card is in the valley. Now for a particular position, we also want to give the agent lesser negative rewards if the velocity is high and more negative rewards if the velocity is low. We do this to encourage the agent to increase its velocity. We divide our rescaled position by the absolute value of the velocity. We divide because if our velocity is high, we want to give it lesser negative rewards. And if our velocity is low, we want to give it higher negative rewards. This is our final reward function. I have also divided a constant because I found the individual values of the rewards were too high. I trained our final agent and these were the results. To my surprise, the agent got trained in only 350 episodes as opposed to our previous run which took 1200 episodes to learn. If you see the behavior, you will see that the agent is optimizing the oscillations and ultimately reaching the goal in the smallest number of steps possible. There you go. Designing the correct reward functions is not easy. It turns out to be very complex. We went through all of this hassle to understand the reward function for the lunar lander problem. Now that we know how to create swift rewards, we are in the position to train the lunar lander agent. The lunar lander problem looks very simple. There is a lander and you have to land it on the surface within 1000 steps. You have a main engine at the bottom and you have left and right engines which control the orientation of the vehicle. The landing pad is in the position 0,0. .0. The coordinate system is this. Our x values towards the right of the landing pad is positive and negative to the left. Our y values towards the top of the pad is positive and negative towards the bottom. There are four actions, do nothing, fire left engine, fire main engine, fire right engine. The state is a vector of eight elements. The first two are the X and Y coordinate position of the lander or the center of mass of the lander. The next two are the linear velocities of the lander in X and Y direction. The fifth one is the angle of the lander and the sixth one is the angular velocity of the lander. The last two values indicate whether the legs are in contact with the ground or not. Seventh element is one if the left leg is in contact with the ground and zero otherwise. Eighth element is the same for the right leg. Our reward function is a shaped reward function. The rewards are plus 10 if any of the legs of the lander touches the surface plus 100 if the lander lands successfully on the surface and some intermediate shaping is done to help the agent keep the lander nice and stable. The shaping variable holds this quantity which you can pause and take a look at. LLC is left leg contact and RLC is right leg contact. These values are 1 if the corresponding leg is in contact with the ground. The reward is actually our current shaping minus our previous shaping. What it basically says is that if the lander is drifting away from a good stable state, we give negative rewards and positive if the agent brings the lander to a stable state. That's not all. We also give it minus 0.3 rewards for firing the main engine every time and minus 0.03 for firing any of the orientation engines. That's our reward function. It's a little too complex to understand for a beginner and that's why I had to teach shaped reward functions and go through um, the hassle of creating shaped reward functions for our old example. But the relief is that we don't have to implement this reward function as it is already in place for you to use in the gym environment. So let's go and code it out. Okay, so we are in our ID and uh, 
for this video what i have kept from the previous video is the evaluator script and the plotter script the evaluator loads in a queue network and displays how the agent is behaving and the plotter script shows real time graphs of the training process we will begin by creating a new uh, training script for our lander lunar lander so i'll use dqn so i mentioned dqn and then lander do you want to add the file in git yes i do uh, i'll close off this one since the dqn code is already coded in our previous video we'll just go there and copy and paste uh, the previous code that we had we have our cartpole example uh, cartpole environment we will switch the environments to lunar lander v2 our network uh, will take in the state which is a vector of eight elements our uh, hidden layer is den64 then we want another den64 and i want another hidden layer of den64 we will output four action values since there are four actions we are using adam optimizer we are using huber loss and we have our target network our parameters uh, will are the same except the number of episodes i want to increase it to 600 you can also go for 800 the rest of the parameters remain the same now one problem that I noticed uh, was having with this environment was that the rewards we were getting from the environment was uh, in float 64 and it was creating problems therefore I had to convert it to float 32. Whatever rewards we are getting we are converting it to float 32 um, so that we don't uh, head into any problems. Our reward function we don't need any because we are going to uh, get the reward from our environment use that one only in our policy for our random action we want to take four random actions so max val equal to four uh, in our uh, in our algorithms loop uh, we are calculating our reward manually we don't want to do that we want to catch the reward that we are getting from the environment next our metric files name is metric csv and our Q network's name is DQN QNet, and that's fine because there is going to be only one Q network in this uh, video, so I'll just keep the name that one. Now, if you run, you will run into a problem. The problem is this: it says that the box 2D is not installed, and we have to install uh, pip install gym box 2D. So we will go to our terminal, and I'll install pip. I, I'll install gym box 2D. So gym box 2D. Now I was having problems while installation, so let's see what this is. So for some reason, uh, this gym box 2D is not being installed. Especially, it's trying to install a package called box 2D Pi, and for some reason, it's not installing. So I have an alternative package to this. So I'll go to my interpreter settings and install that. So I'll type in box 2d and our gym environment was trying to our pip install gym box 2d was trying to install this package box 2d pi but we have this package which does the same job for us so we'll install this all right now that our box 2d is installed if i run this training script probably will not uh, get into any errors all right so our training has started and i will also like to see the uh, real-time graphs so we'll go to our plotter script and I'll just first uh, make sure that I have my metric file path's name correct and it is so I'll run the plotter four plots come up uh, four real time graphs come up and I'll tile them on my screen and we will see what happens after tra the training finishes so let's wait and watch all right so we have uh, finished our training run and these are the metrics for the current training run and you can see that the total rewards per episode increased over time but what happened with the length of the episode is far more interesting you see that the lengths were initially very low and then the lengths went very high and then they came down so what happened was initially the agent was behaving somewhat randomly and the lander was often falling onto the ground after a certain episodes uh, the agent first learned to keep the lander at a stable hover position. So for 1000 steps, it was trying to keep the lander at a hovering position 
and therefore consuming the whole episode trying to do this and after that it started to slowly bring the lander down to the ground that's why the episode lengths have decreased over time seems exactly like how a human would learn to solve this problem isn't it he will initially drop the lander multiple times and then learn to keep it stable in the air and then slowly land i'm glad that our agent is behaving exactly like how a human would behave let's go and uh, see how this agent is behaving so i'll go to my evaluator script you will notice that we have our mountain card example here we'll switch the environments to lunar lander v2 and our dequent's name is dequent qnet we have four random actions uh, four actions and we will change this to lunar lander and our weight key let's keep it 10 so it will be a little fast let's run this and see how it performs all right okay so wow that was a smooth landing nice so that's all we had to do to train our lunar lander problem seems very easy right that's because everything is already implemented and in place for you to use but when you meet a new problem and nothing is already built for you you will start having problems therefore whatever you have learned till now is necessary to implement in the real world this is what i had for you in this series but i want to leave you with something that you can follow after this series to pursue reinforcement learning the first thing i would recommend is the book reinforcement learning by rich certain and andrew bartow this is one of the best books for beginners to study reinforcement learning and a good starting place to explore this field in fact all of the algorithms prior to dqn were taken from this book only Next we did not talk about continuous action spaces we only sticked to discrete action spaces for continuous action spaces there are very good policy gradient algorithms where you directly learn a policy instead of a value or you can learn both policy and value functions using methods like actor critic next you can build reusable architectures for your algorithms we were just copying and pasting the code for our algorithm uh, here to there you can try and build some reusable architectures so that you don't have to code an algorithm for every new environment that you choose to solve next you can build bots that learn to play all kinds of multiplayer games using self play reinforcement learning next you can do even hierarchical reinforcement learning you basically divide your rl problem into multiple sub problems and then solve it there are lots of things that you can pursue in this field Thank you for holding on to this series and I hope I was able to give you enough boost to pursue reinforcement learning as it is the future and holds the key to general AI.